God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's Pure Word of Faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross a listing of all the past programs will then show up. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome to God's Pure Word of Faith. I'm Richard Harden. I'm going to be here with you now for the next hour. I hope you'll stick around with me. Again, I want to thank the Lord and the management of K98 Talk for this great opportunity to share God's Word with you today. Today I'm going to be sharing with you a story that kind of highlights the fact that we should never become complacent with God's Word. As Christians in our society and everything, I've seen so many changes in the attitude of our society and attitude of people to uh, God's Word and Christians since back in the 50s. I can remember back when, you know, uh, they wouldn't have any school activities on Wednesday night because they would, you know, know that so many of the children in school, public school, you know, would be going to some type of worship services. They wouldn't have any uh, school activities on Sunday Sunday afternoon or any time like that because they, they allowed for people to have time to, you know, go to worship services. And I can even remember during that time that a lot of people didn't even go out to eat or do things like that on Sunday. They would they would cook on Saturday, the women would, and prepare the meals, and, and people would then eat on Sunday and, you know, try to respect as much as they could, you know, the laws or the things that had been heard through the years that you're supposed to rest on Sunday, a day of rest, you know, that the Lord has given us and everything. And just, uh, and also the first times that grocery stores started uh, carrying beer, a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't even go in the grocery store that had, you know, beer and things like this in it. But then it got to where the grocery store saw that uh, the ones that were carrying beer and stuff was making so much more money and everything that uh, it got to where it got to be all the grocery stores uh, carried the alcohol and everything. So it just, things have really changed. And uh, there wasn't all this negativism then against Christianity or against people that did go to church. In fact, there seemed to be more respect or something for them, you know. Uh, but that seems to have kind of fallen by the wayside. And instead of people holding standards, Christians have kind of moved over into, you know, going to those movies and everything. I know my wife and I about it, oh, two or three years ago, this real nice movie theater here in town has a balcony where you can eat and go to the movie and everything and, and we got some tickets somewhere I've forgotten now but we went to uh, picked out this movie it sounded like it'd be pretty good and uh, we got our meal started up in the balcony and everything and, and then the movie started as we were 
you know about halfway through our meal and I tell you what that when that movie started we we had to get up and get out of there ever other sentence well ever sentence something like that was just filled with cuss words we couldn't stand it you know it just it was terrible and things have changed so much nowadays but anyway I want to share with you a story and the title of it is died Abner as a fool now in the uh, God's plan for the people when they moved into the promised land, their promised land, and get set up and everything, he wanted to take care of those that might accidentally happen to, you know, hurt or kill someone. And, and uh, he set up, he had the children of Israel set up six cities, three along the eastern coast in kind of the middle of the portion, and three in the western coast, so that uh, everybody in the land of Israel would be close to what was called a city of refuge and then Joshua chapter 20 uh, the Lord spake unto Joshua saying speak to the children of Israel saying appoint out for you cities of refuge whereof I spake to you by the hand of Moses now see he had already told Moses this years before but he's reminding Joshua that that the slayer that kill any person unaware or unwittingly may flee there and shall they shall be your refuge from the avenger of the blood. Those uh, six cities, uh, whichever one's closest to them, if they accidentally kill someone, an axe head fly off while they're chopping wood or something like that, and they hit somebody kill them, well, they're supposed to flee the city of refuge. And when he does flee into one of these cities, he shall stand at the entering of the gate of the city and shall declare his cause to the ears of the elders of the city, and they shall take him into the city and give him a place that he may dwell among them. And if the avenger of the blood, that is the next of kin now to whoever this person was that, you know, got accidentally killed or whatever, the avenger of the blood pursue after him, then they shall not deliver the slayer up to his hand, because he smote his neighbor unwittingly and hated him not before time. So see, it was going to be for an accidental uh, death. And he shall dwell in that city until he stand before the congregation for judgment, and until the day of the high priest shall he stand in that city. Okay. Then shall the slayer return. Well, until the death of the high priest shall he stay in the city. So whoever's a high priest when he enters the city, he has to stay in that city then the rest of his life until that high priest dies. And uh, then he shall be able to return back to his own city, his own house, from where he fled. Now, so they appointed six cities, and uh, there were some rules here that, you know, I'll point out to you that, you know, this is God's word to them, you know, what they're supposed to do to take care of these people and protect them you know, when they have these accidents. Now, first thing, though, you know, the, the died Abner is a fool in uh, Psalms chapter 14, verse 1, and Psalms 53, verse 1. It, it describes there and tells, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So, died Abner as a fool. So what this is saying is, he died as if there is no God. He, In other words, he acted like or lived like there was no God at the time when he was dying. And I'm, I'm using this today because it seems that in our society, so many people are living as if there is no God. Christians and non-Christians. Now you say, well, no, how can a Christian live as if there's no God? Well, by disobeying God's Word and just being neglectful of God's Word. To uh, we, we shouldn't become complacent and just take things for granted. Like for an example, I've used many times here uh, to point this out. In uh, 2 Kings chapter 20, excuse me, not 2 Kings chapter 20, uh, in Second Corinthians two ten and eleven, and hit of myself here, it says to forgive others lest you give Satan advantage. Now, how many Christians, maybe some of you listening even this morning, are holding unforgiveness to someone right now? They've done something to you, maybe hurt you, maybe even hurt you real bad, and you're still holding forgiveness because you, you, you don't believe they deserve to be forgiven. That was so terrible what they did, but see. The Lord on the cross, after people, you know, had arrested him illegally uh, and was 
driving those nails in his hands and feet and stripes on his back and all those things. Uh, they even tried him illegally after they had him arrested illegally everything. But Jesus didn't fight back to them. And on the cross, the love in his heart, because he didn't have to go to the cross. God had given him permission that, that he could not do that if he chose to. Jesus chose of his own to go to the cross for us. Now, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let's see, every one of them, he could have had so much, you know, hate for them and everything because he went through such suffering. So whatever it is that we go through, I know it's hard to do. And many times, you know, um, even without being physically hurt, you get emotionally hurt. And, and I've even had to say, Lord, please help me to forgive because I know it is your will. You know in my heart, I, I really don't feel like it, but help me to forgive because I know it's your will. And we need to do it because like it says there in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, 11, forgive others lest you give Satan advantage. Now, when you give Satan advantage and he comes in and brings these curses into you and does all this harm, like Jesus says in uh, John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He will do everything he can to take your life. Excuse me. So now, don't open the door by disobeying God's law. And that's what happened in this particular case here. The rules for the city of refuge. The first rule was that the person must flee to the city of refuge and then have a trial. Numbers chapter 35 verse 25 says, And the congregation shall deliver the slayer of the hand of the deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of the blood and the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge whether he was fled and he shall abide in it until the death of the high priest which was anointed with the holy oil so he's got to flee to the city of refuge and uh, meet with the elders of the city and there'll be a trial to decide you know was it really a murder or was it accidental that's rule two. It says that there's no way to buy off or have satisfaction or buy off with bribes on the terms of murder or accidental death. If it comes to, if they determine that the person had actually murdered that person, he had had hate against them, or had done something like that, uh, and trying to fake that it was an accidental death at the trial, there was no way for them to buy off, offer a bribe, and get out of the punishment. The term for murder, the person would be killed. But now for the accidental death, it says in Numbers 35, 32, and you shall take no satisfaction for him that is fled to the city of refuge. Now see, here, the person, because of his position back where he lived, you know, his high position in his, you know, city or whatever because of circumstances life before it says you know uh, no satisfaction for it with that accidental death he must then live in that city until the death of the high priest that uh, that was alive at the time he went into the city and then when the, if the high priest die well then he can go back home now for murder in this particular case there must have be two witnesses, two witnesses to testify that actually the person had animosity toward the other one that he had, that had been killed, and that it wasn't an accident that he had intentionally planned it or something. Now the revenger of the blood. This is the next of kin for whoever it was that may have got killed. Okay, Numbers thirty-five twenty-six to twenty-eight says, but if the slayer shall at any time come without the border of the city of his refuge, whether he was fled, the revenger of the blood find him without the borders of the city of his refuge, the revenger of the blood can kill the slayer, and he is not guilty of the blood, because the person who fled to the city of refuge says, because he should have remained in the city of his refuge until the death of the high priest. 
and only after the death of the high priest the slayer shall return unto his land of possession now that means when somebody fled the city of refuge they might have to live there for the next 15 20 30 years till the death of the high priest or if the high priest died the following week he could have got out you know within a week but during that time he's living there he can't slip out at night and sneak back home or something like this to get outside that city of refuge he has got to stay inside the border of the city of refuge. And then rule four, Numbers 35, 29 says, So these things shall be for a statute of judgment unto you throughout the generation in all your dwellings. So this is a statue of judgment that God has set up and everything. Uh, God has set up these rules. He expects them to live by them. But now, as uh, time goes on, you know, this was back when the children of Israel came out of slavery and they were just sitting up there, you know, and they went through uh, the judges that ruled, the, you know, the children of Israel for a while. Then after the judges, the people cried out for a king, and then God gave them um, King Saul, the first king, and then David came along, and, you know, it took, as a young boy, he was anointed king, but he didn't become king until he was age 30 years old. And uh, when they moved in then to the, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, the promised land like this, and, and David becomes king, this is uh, several hundred years after God had set up this rule about the city as a refuge. And so when David uh, was living over with the Philistines near the border of Israel because King Saul had been you know, uh, chasing him and trying to kill him for years. And so he lived outside the city of Israel, uh, excuse me, the, the country of Israel at that time, but very close to it. Well, when uh, King Saul got killed, David prayed. Now, this story about this is in Second Samuel chapter 3, verse 33, um, or chapters 2 and 3, up to verse um, chapter 3, verse 33. Well, Anyway, so David prayed, and God told him, you know, to go on over back to his homeland, you know, go back to Israel. And uh, they anointed David as king then in Judah because they recognized that God had, some of them recognized that God had said years before that David was going to be king. Now, so in Judah, David became anointed he brought his family he had several wives and you know a bunch of children and all this and brought them over there and settled down and Joab was David's general he was his highest general in this particular time well the uh, the rest of the land of Israel Abner the captain of Saul's army the head of Saul's army then uh, established Ishabeth one of Saul's sons to be the king of Israel, being up Ishabeth, King Saul's son, to be king over Israel. There became a dispute. So, let's see now, in uh, 2 Samuel, in chapter 2, it starts out, there was a big determination. Who is going to be king of Israel? Well, David sent his uh, general Joab and Ab, let's see, Ishabeth sent his general Abner with a group, each of them with a group of men, and they were to meet at the pool of Gibeon. This is in verses 12 to 13 of uh, the Second Samuel. They're supposed to meet there and uh, discuss and find out, you know, uh, what can be done to bring these uh, two together. As they sat down and was talking there at the pool of Gibeon, uh, Joab called over to them, and they decided what they would do, for some reason or other. Each side would send 12 young men, and they would fight. They would get together, and this is in, uh, let's see, verse 12 here of uh, chapter 2. It said, 
And Abner, son of Ner, and the servants of Ishabeth, the son of Saul, went out from uh, their cities to Gibeon. And Joab, the servant of David, went out and met together at the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down and one of the, on one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. So they were sitting to where they could, you know, talk back and forth, but the pool was between them. And Abner said to Joab, Let the young men arise and play before us. And it wasn't really play here as we think of play. It was these 12 men from each side was going to go out and fight. Um, it doesn't say here that they had decided that whoever won the fight, you know, like that would have any type of, you know, uh, victor or would decide anything about who's going to be king or anything. But they did. They set it up like this. So there they arose, the 12 from each side, and they went over by the number 12 of Benjamin and so on like this. And they caught every one his fellow by the head and thrust his sword in the fellow's side. See, so that wasn't playing very much. So they fell down together. And um, there was a very sore battle that day. And Abner was beaten and the men of Israel before him, the servants of David. So uh, David's men with Joab then won this battle. And as they were chasing them home, the... David's men with Joab started chasing Abner and his men back to their home. Now, Joab had two brothers with him, Abishai and Asahel. These two brothers and Joab, the three of them there, and you know, Joab now is David's uh, general, they were chasing these people back home because uh, they had overpowered them and everything like this. Now, Ashahel, one of Joab's brothers, he was younger brother, and he was very athletic, uh, but evidently not very smart, but he was very athletic. He could, you know, run very well. He started chasing Abner. Now, Abner's this older man that's a general, you know, over on the Israel side, Ishabeth. So Joab's young brother starts chasing him. In verse 20, uh, Abner asked, uh, Are you Ashahel? And the young man replied, Yes. Now, it, it's interesting to me that they were evidently running close enough that they could talk back and forth. But uh, Ashahel was chasing Abner. And in verse 21 here, Abner said to him, Turn to the side, to thy right hand or to thy left, and lay thee hold on one of the young men, and take thee his armor. But Ashel would not do it. See, he didn't even have any armor, and here he was chasing Abner, the general of the other side. And uh, they were close enough that he asked him, he said, Turn aside, get some armor, do something. He said, I, I can't fight you like this. You know, he was saying it wouldn't be fair. And not only that, what would your brother, what would your brother Joab say? Because Joab and some of the others were chasing also, but, you know, Abner was, a, I mean, uh, Ashahel was the best runner, so he was up closer to Abner. Well, he didn't listen to him. So then in verse 22, Abner says again to him, turn aside, I can't fight you. I can't fight you. You don't have any armor or everything like that. See, he, he, he didn't want to hurt the guy, the young man. That's the reason I said, you know, he might have been a, fa or a way to fight. He said, I can't fight you. What will Joab say? See, he's concerned about this. Well, verse 23 then, um, Ashahel would not turn aside. So he got so close to him that Abner then had to kill him. Because if he wasn't, the young man was going to kill him. That's what he was chasing him for. So he speared him, and it says, and pointed out that he run, run his spear under the fifth rib of Ashahel, Joab's younger brother, and killed him. And I'll leave it right there, and we'll be right back in just a minute. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him, and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network.
visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's pure word of faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. this story it's about uh, being complacent with God's word God had set up when the children of Israel came out of slavery and they went over to Israel God had set up or had them set up six cities called cities of refuge you know so often you read in the scriptures about um, where Solomon and David and others that wrote part of the Psalms and everything said we flee to God he is our refuge and our strength well this is kind of where that comes from because God actually had instructed them to set up these six cities that if somebody accidentally killed someone, chopping wood or doing something, you know, or if they threw a rock and it accidentally hit somebody and killed them or whatever, but the person was to flee to these cities or flee to the nearest city and um, meet with the council there, explain what happened, have something like a trial, and um, if it was act- determined to be accidental, the person would have to live in that city of refuge until the, whoever was the high priest at that time when they entered the city, they would have to live there and not leave the city until after the high priest died and a new high priest. Now, why it was selected like that? But that's just the way God set it up. So if they were caught outside the city at any time, for the rest of their life now until the high priest died the avenger of the blood who was the next of kin you know uh, somebody's brother or dad or uncle or something like that whoever the next of male next of kin was the avenger of the blood if the avenger of the blood caught the person outside the city limits outside the you know the whatever determined you know like the city limit and everything uh, the walls of the city or, or whatever He could kill that person, even though the person had accidentally killed someone and he was in there for protection. If he came outside the city limit, he was fair game to the avenger of the blood. He could kill him and nothing would be done about it. That was just the rule. Okay, now, so here, when uh, King Saul died, David was anointed king in Judah, part of Israel. Well, the rest of Israel... uh, Abner, King Saul's uh, captain of his army when he died, set up his son Ishabeth as king of Israel. Well, here David down here has been anointed as king of part of Israel, the Judah, and so there's a friction here. Who's who's supposed to be king? And David, his general Joab, had you know three bro- two brothers. Abisha and uh, Ashahel. Well, David sent some of his men over with Joab, and Ishabeth, King Saul's son, who was being anointed as king as the rest of Israel, with his uh, general Abner, sent Abner over to meet King David's people, Joab, 
to have some type of discussion or meeting at the Pool of Gibeon. Well, when they got there, um, they decided they would take 12 young men from each side and send them out there to fight each other. I don't know whether, you know, like if, if 12 of this side won, you know, what would happen or not, but it turned out it became a free-for-all, and it wasn't just the 12 young men fighting. The Both sides started fighting, and there was about, uh, oh, I don't know, three or 400 people killed that day. Abner's side, Ishabeth, the son of King Saul, his side lost the battle. So Joab and his brothers and the other men with him started chasing them away. And as they did, it points out here that Ashahel, one of uh, Joab's younger brothers, was a very good runner. So here he starts chasing Abner, the general of the other side, and he's very fast. I guess the general being older and everything, you know, couldn't run that fast. But uh, he starts catching up with him, and the general hollers back at him in one of the cases and said, Are you Ashahel? And he says, Yes. They were close enough. See, like that, they talk back and forth during this. And so uh, Abner asked Ashahel, Turn aside from chasing me. And, Go get some armor to fight. You know, if I'm going to have to fight you, you know, like that, at least get some armor or something like that. See, I wanted it to be an honorable fight. You know, because a young man evidently didn't have any um, protective gear or anything like that. And uh, he wouldn't do it. So Abner again says to him, turn aside. And verse 22, I can't fight you like this. What will your, you know, brother Joab say? Well, he still wouldn't do it. In verse 23, I guess he came so close to Abner that he, he couldn't resist him anymore. So uh, in verse 23 then, how be it he refused to turn aside, speaking of Ashahel. Wherefore Abner with his hinder end of the spear smote him under the fifth rib that the spear came out behind him and he fell down there and died. And so here he had, Ashbel had just attacked him without any of that gear. And as Abner had been trying to tell him, you know, I'm going to have to kill you if you keep on. Well, he did. He had to kill him. Joab and Abishai, the brother, was also chasing. And it says, and the sun went down when they were come to the hill of Amma that lieth before Gia on the way to the wilderness of Gibeon, they found, you know, their brother. But then Abner was still close by, and he called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not that it will be bitterness in the latter end? How long shall it be then, ere thou bid the people return from following their brethren? So he was talking to him, saying, Let's stop this now, you know. Uh, and then Joab finally, you know, agreed, and um, he blew the trumpet, it says in verse 28, and all the people stood still and pursued um, after Israel no more, neither fought they any more. So Abner then goes back to his home with uh, Ishabeth, King Saul's son, and takes his men that are remaining, and Joab returns back over to Hebron, where King David is, with his men. And... Um, it was quite a battle there. But now, that's not the end of the story. The uh, problem is then, when uh, they get back and get separated here, Abner and uh, Ishabeth, King Saul's son that Abner had set up as the, you know, the king of Israel and was trying to you know, help him uh, uh, capture all of Israel, they got into a disagreement. Uh, King Saul had a concubine. Now the disagreement's over a woman. And it came to pass, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner made himself strong for the house of Saul. See, Abner's really getting to be a big guy uh, with King Saul's son, the king. Okay. But now Saul had a concubine. King Saul did. 
whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of, well, Ari, something like that. Anyway, Ishabeth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone in to my father's concubine? So he accuses um, Abner, true or false, it doesn't say here, but he accuses Abner of having sex with his daughter's, I mean, his dad's concubine. You know, King Saul's dead now, but you know, uh, anyway, this really upset Abner. And, um, well, so much so he said, Am I a dog's head, which against Judah, do, you know, I show kindness this day into the house of Saul, thy father, to his brethren, and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to help you get to be king and everything, and, and you're accusing me of this? Well, it upset him so much then that he decided that he was going to try to change sides and, uh, position and go over and be with David and work with David then as you know one of his generals he does this he sends a message in verse 19 <coughs> and so Abner also spoke in the ears of Benjamin and Abner went also to speak in the ears of David in Hebron all it seemed good he was going to tell him you know that I'll help you get to be king over all of uh, Israel. And after uh, Abner came to David and they talked and he'd even brought some men along with him and everything like that, David sent him away and was pleased with it and was going to allow him to come back over then and be a part of his kingdom. And uh, then they were going to work to get David to be king over the whole land of Egypt. I mean, it's the whole land of Egypt, excuse me, the whole land of Israel. Well, at that time when he went back over there, he didn't meet Joab while he was there because Joab was out fighting uh, for David someplace. It just says he was out, you know, uh, chasing some people or something like that. Uh, but when he came back, one of his men, when Joab and all the hosts that was with him were come, they told Joab, saying, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king, and the king sent him away, and he has gone in peace. And then Joab, you know, he's the avenger of the blood for Ashahel that Abner killed, his younger brother. Joab came to the king and said, What hast thou done? Behold, Abner came unto thee. Why is it that thou hast sent him away, and he is quiet gone, or he's gone in peace. Thou knowest Abner, the son of Ner, and that he came to deceive thee, to try to, you know, spy out on the land and everything. And when Joab was come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner and brought him back again. Now, see, Abner had left and was heading back to his home, and then Joab comes back from a battle and talks to David and then he, when he gets through talking to David, he sends people to, to catch up with uh, Abner and say, Hey, you know, uh, we need to talk. And when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak to him quietly and smote him there. Listen to that now. See, I've pointed out a couple of times here, David, headqu his headquarters was at Hebron, which was a city of refuge. Now, as long as Abner was in that city of refuge, he would have been protected. But no, he was outside. He was going back to his home. Joab then tricked him and said, come back. I need to talk to you quietly. Uh, and here's it again. Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him there under the fifth rib just like he had killed his younger brother and Abner died for the blood of Ashel his brother see so here Abner gets killed right outside the gate of that city of refuge Joab remembered the law and, and abided by it because if if you catch a person outside the city of refuge that's you know uh, kill somebody accidentally or not you know something like that uh, it was fair game for the blood avenger to kill him. 
Now, after when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord for the, uh, ever from this blood of Abner. Let it rest on the head of Joab and on all his father's house, and let there not fall from the house of Joab one that has an issue, or that is a leper or something like this. And he goes on to like this because of what he did. So Joab and Abishai, the other brother, slew Abner because he had slain their brother Ashahel. And David said to Joab and all the people that were with him, Rent your clothes, gird you with sackcloth, and mourn for Abner. And King David himself followed the briar. And they buried Abner in Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. And here's what David had to say then. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool dieth. See, he died as a fool because he was acting or he had just disregarded God's word. God's word was that he should be in that city of refuge. Now, if, if he had went inside the city of refuge to talk to Joab, Joab would not have had a right to kill him. But Joab kind of tricked him to get him outside the city uh, so he could kill him and met him out there said, I want to talk with you quietly. But then King David says, Died Abner as a fool dieth. Thy hands were not bound, nor thy feet put in fetters. As a man falleth before wicked men, so fellest thou. And all the people wept over him. See, he said, he was saying, Abner, you know, your hands weren't bound. Your feet weren't, you know, in fetters. You know, and you just neglect on your part to pay attention to what you were doing and to God's law. And um, there was nothing done to Joab. Joab had the right to kill him, and he did. He didn't want him coming back over, and he was going to take it up for his, you know, Abner killing his brother. Now, we have people today in our society, as I said before, compromising to God's word, compromising, and, you know, just a, a little bit of sin here, a little bit of sin there. Failing to forgive others is one of the biggest ones I've uh, run into. Is Well, I say a reason that because through the years now, I'm a handwriting analyst. And it can show in people's, you know, analysis so easy that they're holding bitterness back in the past against someone. And I counsel them every time. I say, you know, you can't do that. You've got to let go of it. But you've got to do more than just let go of it. Start praying for that person that's hurt you. Pray for that person because whatever they did to hurt you was not God working through them to hurt you. It was the devil working through them to hurt you. So, regardless of what happened, and they hurt you, start praying for them to be delivered from the devil so that they won't hurt anybody else. Or that they'll be set free from the devil. Because it wasn't God working through them that hurt you. So, God wants them to be delivered. So, you will be getting in God's will if you pray for the person you need to forgive because God wants that person to never hurt anybody else like that. So to be in God's will for sure if you have hard feelings toward anyone back in your past if you have unforgiveness it's not only hurting you today because in 2 uh, Corinthians 2 10 11 says forgive others lest you give Satan advantage as long as you are holding that unforgiveness you are allowing the devil to have advantage in your life <clears throat> your prayers are being hindered that means for your family your prayers for your wife your children and others are being hindered your prayers for your church are being hindered your prayers for your business are being hindered everything in your life is suffering some because of you opening the door and holding unforgiveness when you know it's God's will to forgive other people. In fact, in, in Matthew, you know, the, in the, during a Sermon on the Mount where Jesus was teaching them to pray, you know, after the prayer where he says, you know, uh, if you don't forgive others, said, when you stand praying, if you don't forgive others, 
your heavenly Father won't forgive you. And in the prayer we say, you know, forgive us our sins as we forgive others. As we forgive others. You know, when you pray that prayer and you say, as we forgive others, you better not be holding any unforgiveness against anyone. Because that means you're asking God to not forgive you. But anyway, see, this is so serious. It, it's not just a, a joke or something or a, a technique or a philosophy or anything like that. The scripture, God's word, says forgive others lest you're giving Satan advantage in your life. So if any of you have unforgiveness, the greatest thing you can do today is start praying for that person. And you will be set free. You can't go back and change anything. And your anger and your hurt is not in any way hurting that person any. But your prayers could be a blessing to them. Pray for their deliverance. And then one day you'll say, oh, I truly would like to see God bless so-and-so. I've got people back in my past that I hated so much when I became a Christian. And, and you know, one of the first things when God put his spirit of love in me like that, I was saying, oh, they need to they need to know what I found. They need to know it. I, and then my thought was to share with them and help them get delivered too. You know, life by giving Satan advantage in your life. Just like in other areas, you know, like that in James, it says, uh, if he knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to you it is sin. If, well, if you're sinning see, or, you know, committing an act of sin, that means you're blocking God's love in you and through you to that person right then. And see, that is the bad part of it is you're blocking some of God's love in your, into your heart. And you want as much as God's love as possible in you. So turn and start praying. Uh, lost people now, you know, that they're rejecting the love of God's salvation. When he brings the message, the grace of God to bring a salvation, appear to all men. And then it says the scripture, the, the gospel preached to them, did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And what it means is that when they heard God, but only if you hear and receive into your heart. So they're not mixing the gospel with faith or receiving it into their word. I mean, excuse me, receiving it into their heart. They're just hearing it in their head and say, oh, well, I'm, I, I want to sow my wild oats before I turn to God. Or I want to, you know, get out of college first. Or I want to, you know, get married. I get my life straightened out. All kind of excuses not to receive the love of God's word into their heart. But now, that is living then. You know, like it said in the Old Testament there, a fool. It, you're living your life then by rejecting God's word. God and his word are the same. So you're living your life rejecting God as if there is no God. And you're getting the results in your life as if, you know, uh, you don't have God in your life. Even Christians, if you're holding unforgiveness. Or like in First Peter 3, 7, Husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, being joint heirs of grace of life. As under the weaker vessel, lest your prayers be hindered. And uh, there's so many things in the scripture like that, that if we aren't careful, you know, like it, we're going to be blocking God's love in our heart and rejecting God's love. Then we're going to be giving Satan advantage in our life. And the thief only comes to steal, kill and destroy. And that's why, you know, that uh, I wanted to share this day because hundreds of years after God had set up those cities of refuge, Abner was complacent with God's word and didn't stay inside the city of refuge when he knew he was meeting the blood avenger of the young man that he had killed. See, if he had thought about God's word and the rules of the city of refuge, he would have known better than to meet Joab outside the city to have that quiet talk. Joab didn't want to have a quiet talk. He wanted to obey God's rules and be able to catch Abner outside the city of refuge and he did and so he then killed Abner and uh, there wasn't anything done to him um, but uh, King David says Abner Abner why diest thou as a fool and we have our hospitals filled with Christians all across our country that have unforgiveness in their hearts to people that have got them there the devil has got them in the hospital sick you know like that and he's going to keep on he takes their lives or they've uh, been involved in some kind of crooked deal or something like that in business and that crooked deal you know um, if you look through Proverbs and everything God does not like unjust weights and what it means is you know when you're weighing 
uh, produce and things like this, you know, and you say, well, it's a little heavier than it is to sell it or something like this, you know, unjust weights and, and all this. And when people are involved in crooked deals, they're giving Satan advantage in their life. When you steal things, you're giving Satan advantage in your life. See, it, it depends on the things you're doing like that. Now, uh, we don't lose our salvation for committing those acts and you know, holding unforgiveness and things like this, but we certainly are giving the devil advantage here on earth and we're suffering here and living as if there is no God. We need to be studying, studying and seeking God's word and doing the best we can to live by him. If, if you're listening today, and I had a friend tell me months ago, you know, that he just said, you know, yes, the Lord called me and, and, and I didn't want to change my lifestyle then, so I, I didn't respond to him. If you're listening today and you haven't received Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, God has promised in Ezekiel 36, 26, of the new covenant. He says, a new heart also will give you a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh. He's going to give us a new heart, a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit, Christ, within you. He'll put his spirit, his living word, in us. See? But we got to confess our sins. It says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, now, neglecting God's word or putting Him off like that is giving Satan the advantage in your life. You're suffering from it. Your loved ones, everybody is. We're not a child of God until the Spirit of Christ comes in our heart. Romans 8 and 9 says, Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, we're we're creatures that he's created and everything but we're born without any spirit of God in us we have to invite his spirit to come in us and all you have to do then Romans 10 13 whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved but it's got to be an honest repentant prayer wanting to turn from your sins not just to say like I'm getting saved and you know I'm gonna you know uh, not go to hell or something like that not just an insurance thing but you've got to invite him to come into your heart and surrender your heart and life to him. And, and it is so sad for so many people that neglect that. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Pray along with me now. Just say, Jesus, I ask you to please forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of my sins. Come into my heart. I want to turn from my sins and I surrender my heart and life to you. And I invite you to come into my heart to create in me that new heart, the clean heart and live in my heart I want to be a child of God in your name Jesus I ask amen you know just it doesn't have to be those exact words in the, let's see second Corinthians 3 16 it says when the heart of man turns to the Lord the veil of separation lifted when the veil of separation between our heart and God like in the Old Testament temple the, the veil between the people and the holy of holies where God was and everything see that veil of separation, God will come into us just calling out from a pure, I mean, from a heart that has a total desire. You shall seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. God says, right now is your day, your time for salvation. Call out to the Lord and receive him into your heart. Now a short message on Calvinism, which is a predestination to heaven or hell prior to our birth. John 3, 16, 17. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, Jesus, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now my revision is this. For John 3.16 For God so loved the people of the world that he gave his only begotten son Jesus that Jesus should endure the loneliness, the suffering of the perfect walk of faith and the painful sufferings of his seven sprinklings of his blood on the cross by the crown of thorns, the plucking of his beard, the nails in his two feet, the nails in his two hands and the terrible stripes on his back that Jesus would go through all this suffering God allowed these sufferings in his mercy so that all of God's already pre-elected and predestined people
prior to birth to die and go to heaven that they would actually die and go to heaven. That sounds so ridiculous. If only predestined or elected people prior to their birth go to heaven, then there would have been no need for the work and suffering of Jesus. No one's destiny would or will ever be changed by Jesus' suffering and death on the cross for our sins and salvation, because everything required for our salvation would have already been done prior to our birth by God's act of electing and predestining us to heaven or hell before birth. After God has predestined us to heaven or hell, there would be no need or no more to be done in heaven and earth. It would already be finished before our birth. So what's happening here is the devil hates Jesus so much that he's come up with this Calvinist, devilish, deceived theology that would have us think that we're predestined or elected prior to birth to go to heaven or hell, and that would make all the suffering and work of Jesus as our Savior totally unnecessary, totally worthless, and Jesus totally useless. For his life and death on the cross would not change anything prior to, you know, people dying and going to heaven or hell. Because it's already been done by God predestining and electing them to heaven or hell before we were born. See how ridiculous that is? Good day. God bless you. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's Pure Word of Faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. K98 Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at advertise at k98talk.org. K98talk.com, a leader in Internet radio. So grab your seatbelts and take the ride of your life on K98talk.com. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. 
If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books.